This program contains content that may disturb some viewers. Beneath the bucolic surface of Sydney's suburban hills district lie secrets and shame. Former students of local private schools are grappling with a troubling question. What happens when freedom of religious expression strays into misinformation? These young people are being taught ridiculous things that are unsafe and it's just okay it's it's just seen as okay and it's just not pornography was going to cause physical holes in your brain that's right graduates of schools associated with an obscure but powerful catholic organization are speaking out for the first time I know there's kids going through that schooling system right now who are experiencing exactly what I did, and it's miserable. It is hell on earth, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Why isn't the public aware of this? How is this all happening behind closed doors? These schools follow the principles of Opus Day. New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet has spent his entire life in this Sydney school community. It's nurtured his political ascendancy. The Perrottets are a very large family. They've been at the schools for a very long time. People connected to the schools and Opus Dei are revealing how they were expected to engage in practices they now believe are damaging. You showed us lists of year nines that you were hoping to recruit to Opus Day. Yeah. So you were thinking about those year nines? Yes. While you were whipping yourself? Yeah. In this episode of Four Corners, inside the secret world of the schools and study centres connected to Opus Dei, the conservative Catholic organisation with links to the powerful. These schools are heavily subsidised by Australian taxpayers and attended by the children of high profile politicians. But dozens of former students have told Four Corners they are permanently scarred by their education. At the end of each academic year, a graduating group of schoolgirls gathers in identical white gowns. The whiteness, it's about virginity, it's about chastity. The tradition has carried on for decades. Everyone wearing white dress, everyone wearing the same dress, being like almost presented to society, like it's like we're living 50 years ago or something. How important was purity to the central ethos of the school? I think for, for girls, purity is everything. <laughs> I think purity was our, our, our most prized char characteristic above mm. anything else about ourselves. We were given a piece of sticky tape and asked to pass it from person to person all the, all the way around the class. And by the time it got to the last person, the teacher asked the class, what value does this sticky tape have anymore? It's dirty, it's not sticky, uh, it doesn't fulfil its function anymore. And the teacher said to us, 
That's what happens to you when you have sex before marriage, when you have multiple partners. You're not worthwhile anymore because you're dirty and unusable. The concept of purity was inculcated into these young women at a private school in Cherrybrook in Sydney's northwest, called Tangara School for Girls. Tangara and its brother school, Redfield College, follow the philosophy of Opus Dei's Jose Maria Escrivar. His argument that the parents should create home as a sort of church, as a domestic church, and that the role of education was to be a partner with the parents in this religious worldview formation. Opus Dei is a small but powerful organisation with only 650 Australian members. There's nothing else like it in the Catholic Church. Professor Claire Monagall is a theological historian. Her uncle was one of the founding parents who set up the schools connected to Opus Dei. Opus Dei adherents believe profoundly in an organised, institutional, hierarchical church. They're not interested at all in what we've seen as some of the more progressive or liberalising movements in the church. The schools were established by a group of parents in the 1980s known as the Pared Foundation. These schools are not part of the Catholic system, although they do provide Catholic chaplains, Opus Dei chaplains. The people who set up these schools, you know, very um, pragmatically and sensibly took advantage of the fact that in Australia we provide significant state aid to independent schools. And now I would say that Opus Dei's biggest realm of influence in Australia and where it is able to get the most traction is through these educational structures. Tangara's promotional videos are glossy and appealing. The school is proud of its mentorship program. Every child is paired up with an adult who guides their personal and spiritual development. Alumni and former parents from Tangara and the boys' school Redfield have told Four Corners that what's missing from the marketing is that these mentors are often Opus Dei numeries celibate members of Opus Dei who live in a study centre and are encouraged to recruit for the organisation, or supernumeraries who are married members of Opus Dei. I basically spent my years at Tangara trying to not be converted. It was a fairly 360 degree assault. Uh, we were all given what was called a tutor at school. Your tutor, who would be one of the teachers at the school, would knock on the door and would take you out of your class for 10, 15 minutes to just have a chat about you and your life and where you are spiritually. And you know, on the face of it, having somebody who's invested in your child, of course that sounds lovely. Unfortunately, that person who's invested in your child has their own agenda because... Which is what? Which is recruitment into Opus Dei. Many students attend after-school study centres, which the schools claim are separate, yet heavily promote them in newsletters seen by Four Corners. The study centres are home to many of the numerary teachers and students go straight after school to Eromeran for the girls and Nairana for the boys. If you were to go to the Nairana Study Centre after school, one of the numeraries who lived in that facility would tap you on the shoulder. 
they would ask you about your life and have you started to notice girls and what do you think about girls and have you thought about joining Opus Dei? They're just enculturation centres, right? Ronan Williams was Redfield school captain and he attended the Narana study centre every day after school. While there one day, his friend stumbled upon a black book with lists of boys' names. There were comments about uh, what some of his weaknesses were and maybe, you know, what overall strengths he could offer as a, I guess, recruit. I can't think of a better word. Recruit is really the right word here. Alex is a former Opus Dei teenage numeri who is familiar with those lists. She's kept a box full of memories of her time inside Opus Dei, including very detailed diaries. So Alex, you have a list of names here of, of people. Um, it says year nine. What, what's this? Um, that's a list of the girls that I was working with um, at the study centre. I was helping, tr trying to get them closer to God, but also possibly see their vocation to Opus Dei. Um, Alex says she was encouraged to try to convert Tangara's teenage students to Opus Dei. So there were usually other people working in the centre that would liaise with you about the people that were attending and discuss with you who they thought were like strong targets for recruiting to Opus Dei as numeries. We were really encouraged to have a list so that every month you could kind of report back on what things you'd actually done with those people individually. So they keep track of everything. Like there was a literal folder that had these people's names in it. But I'm looking at this, it's, it says year nine, like these are 14 year olds. Yeah, look, I, I definitely think um, Opus Dei tries to attract people quite young because when you're that young and you're a teenager, you see the world in an idealistic way. Getting them not to judge other people, but- When Alex was a numeri, she lived in the study centre with another numeri, Katrina Alvia, a teacher at Tangara. Katrina Alvia features in the school's promotional videos. I do friendship workshops, one's called Owning Up, and um, it's getting them to see the different roles they play in the- Katrina Alvia definitely had a list as a popular tutor for people that were in their teen years. She seemed to be able to bring up the conversation of vocation much more successfully than other numeries. So from what you saw, Katrina Alvia was trying to recruit teenagers to Opus Dei. Definitely. The Pared schools and Opus Dei denied in statements they attempt to recruit students and say they do not encourage the practice. The allegations go further. Tangara alumnus Sam Green has very distinct memories about Katrina Alvia. She was a religion teacher um, and she was also a tutor. I've seen photos of her recently. She still looks quite young. And I think that enabled her to ingratiate herself with the younger students who saw her as more of a big sister than a teacher. And we just wanted to make sure that you knew about purity and love. Okay. Katrina Alvia is the teacher behind the camera filming this video of Year 8 girls to be presented to their Year 12 future selves. Awesome. Year 12. Year 12. 2000 and... 2000. Hey, me. <laughs> future, I mean, future me in Year 12. Um, okay, remember that believe in yourself and believe in God because, like, your virginity is a diamond and you have to save it and keep it clean until you get your husband. Four Corners has spoken to several young women in the video who graduated in 2015. They are now disturbed by the messaging they were given. Yeah, sorry, just cover those knees. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. I'll just say that you should like respect yourself and then not your sons. <laughs> Bye, future me. Okay. The way she encourages the girls to talk about themselves 
you know, these young girls are saying to their, to their future selves, please don't be a slut when I grow up. And Miss Alvia's behind the camera laughing. She's a teacher. She, she's, she's in a position of power. Sam Green remembers Miss Alvia wanting to dispel myths about Opus Dei in the Da Vinci Code film, particularly the self-mortification practiced by a murderous albino monk. So, Sam Green says, Katrina Alvia brought into class the actual whip, known as the discipline that she and other Opus Dei numeries used. She wanted to clear up uh, the inaccuracies in the film and one of her ways of doing that was bringing in the discipline to show us that it wasn't this huge long rope uh, that Silas the monk hits himself with over his shoulders and he's got these huge welts that are bleeding. But what she showed us was just as grotesque. Still a whip. Still a whip, still fabric with knots, still a handle. And I could see it doing some real damage. I would say by showing us the discipline and explaining the process to us, in my eyes, it glorified self-harm. Tangara says Katrina Alvia denies bringing the whip to school. Opus Dei numeries, like those who often mentored the girls at Tangara, are required to practice what is known as self-mortification, mirroring the suffering of Christ, like sleeping on a wooden board. At her home, Alex showed us what's known as the psyllis. Uh, so this is the psyllis which was given to me when I was in Opus Dei, in my first year in Opus Dei. Um, so it is a barbed wire thing that we would tie around our thigh and we had to wear it um, one hour a day as, as a form of mortification or what they'd call corporal mortification, like mortification of the body. What was it like wearing that? I always tell people that have asked me about it, like, you never get used to it. Every time you wear it, it's painful. As well as being expected to wear the spiky barbed wire-like psyllis around her thigh, the 18-year-old Numeri was also given a discipline with which to whip herself while she prayed. Did it hurt? I think it was the idea that if it didn't hurt, what was the point? If it didn't hurt, what were you, what kind of graces were you winning for the people that you were praying for to join Opus Dei? You were thinking of people that you were trying to recruit into Opus Dei while you were whipping yourself? Yes. So you showed us lists of Year Nines that you were hoping to recruit into Opus Dei, you were thinking about them as you were whipping yourself. I think it's difficult to hear those words spoken back to me because when I think of it now, it's just, it seems so wrong. Children, effectively. Yeah, that's right. But you weren't that long from being a child yourself. No, I was 18 at the time and obviously very impressionable and wanting to be a faithful numeri. It makes me extremely angry. I think that, op that the schools are completely dishonest about what they are. I think a lot of the parents at the schools are actually in the dark about what is happening um, inside those schools. <laughs> As well as anger about these practices of what Opus Dei numeries were expected to do, Tangara alumni are also disturbed at being taught false information. One of the things that most concerns them 
is negative messaging about the HPV cervical cancer vaccine that is given to year seven and eight students in schools across Australia. The school sent home a letter to the parents saying that we have to offer this to the girls. We recommend that they don't get it because it promotes promiscuity. It encourages them to sleep around and be unvirtuous to their future husbands. From what I can tell, you know, three or four people out of a class of 35, it worked. The letter worked. There were only a few of us that went and got the vaccine. It caused a kind of furor. They made it very clear that this was a vaccine for an STD and you wouldn't need this vaccine unless you were planning to be sexually promiscuous. And so this is a life-saving cancer vaccine? Yeah, and given for free to all school-age children. So did you get the vaccine? No, I didn't get the vaccine. I don't think my sisters did either. In my year, I think there were only two people that out of 50-something girls that got the HPV vaccine. Vaccinated young women describe a so-called walk of shame. Sam Green recalls a teacher's reaction when she raised her hand in class to say that she and another student had to go for their injection. She launched into us and, you know, was telling us it was a terrible idea for us to go and get this vaccine. You know, it, it's, it's encouraging us to sleep around. We are going to be sluts when we're older, all these sorts of things. I raised the very valid point with her that I could get the, this virus from my husband. And um, yeah, she basically told us to not come back after we'd had the vaccine back to that class. A parent of a graduate of the class of 2020 told Four Corners she was called to a school meeting where the vaccine was discussed. She was horrified to hear it being discouraged on the grounds that the girls wouldn't need it because they would only have one sexual partner. When another mother challenged this, there was a noticeable cooling in the room and she was stared down by other parents in attendance and her comment was not responded to by the presenters. Tangara admits it wrote to parents about the vaccine prior to 2020, when it claims it was relatively new. By 2020, the vaccine had been given in schools for 13 years. The school's statement says they now provide information to students that's in line with accepted medical advice. Isabella Kershaw was in the Tangara class that graduated in 2020, although her experiences there led her to leave early. So we were given a worksheet in class um, with this image um, and our religion teacher told us that the images were MRIs of brains with physical holes in the brain tissue. Um, so and where are the, the holes? So these dark places here that are illuminated, which are really just, just the basic anatomy of the brain, we were told that those were the holes caused by pornography. That pornography was going to cause physical holes in your brain. That's right. Um, and myself and my best friend at the time um, sort of immediately knew that, you know, that wasn't real um, because it would kill you if you had holes in your brain. And we raised that with our teacher at the time um, and I was sent out of class. Um, we did a Google search, just a basic Google search. It became clear that the image is actually showing what parts of your brain are active while viewing pornography. Isabella's mother was so concerned she requested a meeting at the school. We were essentially told that truth and fact is secondary to, you know, your ethos. And in a school. In a school, yeah. Tangara received $5 million in government funding in 2021, up by $2 million in just the previous five years. Pared's four schools in Sydney received more than $20 million in government funding in 2021. If they're receiving this level of taxpayer funding, why aren't they accountable to the taxpayers? Why isn't the public aware of this? How is this all happening behind closed doors? 
when I got to Tangara, there were sections of textbooks blacked out, like with textile, that related to sex education. This is really about access to information about female health. It's the state approved curriculum. Exactly. Is religious freedom ever an excuse for teaching students information that's demonstrably untrue? Never. You go to school to learn about things that are true, things which are provable. You don't go to school to be given misinformation and lies. Freedom of speech isn't freedom from consequences. That's, that's just the way it goes. And by all means, these teachers can believe whatever they want in terms of holes in the brain when you view pornography. You know, they can believe that those things are real, but you shouldn't be able to show those things to impressionable young people. You know, you can... The syllabus is there for a reason. Tangara says it has not redacted textbooks since 2017, and it now follows the New South Wales curriculum. It and Redfield College do still invite chastity speakers, like Redfield old boy Simon Carrington, whose website is endorsed by the current principal of Tangara and senior staff at Redfield. I struggled with masturbation and pornography for many years. Masturbation is, is an intrinsically and, and gravely disordered action. Four Corners has spoken to more than 30 former students of Tangara and Redfield, graduating between 2001 and 2021. Some of them come from strictly observant families, including founding parents of the schools. And if identified, these young people risk being ostracised by their families and their communities. Some of them are very recent graduates with siblings still at the schools. One religious education class, our teacher showed us a documentary on how the abortion and the birth control pill causes cancer. Without getting the approval or consent of parents, we were then shown this video. It depicts cartoon images of fetuses with their limbs being ripped off. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed. This video shown to the girls at Tangara is not an accurate depiction of how abortions are conducted in Australia. Girls cried. You know, it was, it was, it was emotive stuff. I was watching it thinking, well, this isn't true. This isn't how it happens. This is completely incorrect. One of the stories Tangara graduates are most disturbed by is about a young martyred saint, Maria Goretti, who was stabbed 14 times rather than allow her neighbour to rape her. I feel sick when I think about my education. Maria Goretti is one of the things I always think about. Maria Goretti was only 11 years old. She made the decision that she would rather die than go to hell for being a victim of rape. And we were taught to glorify her and revere her as a symbol of chastity and purity and virginity and a teen saint that we should aspire to be like in our daily lives. The message that we got was definitely that once your virginity was gone, you were worthless. Um, Even if you're raped. Exactly, yeah. Have you got other school ones in here? Um, I... Consent is frequently raised by Tangara and Redfield alumni. <laughs> Students say the message was women were partially responsible for sexual assault by men. The idea was that men couldn't control themselves, basically. Men had these urges um, and, I don't know, women supposedly didn't. And it was kind of our responsibility to, um, to help men, I suppose, by, by not tempting them. Men are wild stallions and it's up to women to hold the reins. 
Yeah. Men are like dogs, and if you put the food in front of them, they have to eat it. These messages have been communicated even to the most recent graduates. I can never remember ever being taught any form of consent education, besides being told how men might take our short dresses and excessive makeup as consent, blaming us for giving them that idea. It's like leaving the door unlocked for a robber. We were told it was our fault for making a man lust us. I was depressed because I had been sexually assaulted. The teacher said we are making our hearts dirty when we have sex with more people. When I read these stories, I cried. I mean, it was extremely upsetting to hear that students now, or in recent years, are having the exact same experiences that I had 20 and 25 years ago. And what I usually find is... Opus Dei Numeri and mentor Martin Fitzgerald has taught at Redfield College for three decades. Blog posts written by Mr Fitz, as he was known by the boys, include in 2021 saying he doesn't believe in consent training for schoolboys. He says teaching abstinence is the only solution. In 2017, this was his response to the Harvey Weinstein scandal. Sex is too powerful an urge to be negotiated. The very notion of rational consent to powerful passions, especially when alcohol is involved, is absurd. Who was the bright spark who came up with the laughable proposal that men ask consent of women every step of the way? It's absurd to expect men to stop midstream and ask permission for the next move. I can't imagine a teacher going so far as to, to say it is unreasonable to, to ask for consent along the way. Like, we're not rabid dogs, we're thinking rational human beings that can be considered and empathetic of others' feelings. And yes, there are sexual desires, but that doesn't make us untethered to reality and reason. Redfield says Martin Fitzgerald's views are not necessarily representing the views of the college and he won't be teaching consent classes. It says it will follow the new New South Wales curriculum on consent. Many of the Redfield graduates speak of a toxic culture at the school. I would get called a faggot on a daily basis. I would get called a poofta, homo, any derivative that you can think of. As a young boy, Tim Pocock became an opera singer and a musician. It opened the floodgates for just complete and utter unrelenting torture. Um, it brought me so much joy to be an opera singer and to play piano and to be good at music. And then that thing that gave me so much joy was what then made me a target during the day. I would spend all day at school hiding in the bathrooms so that I wouldn't be picked on by students. I would eat my lunch in the toilets. That was my life for so many years. Um, I would go so far as to put toilet paper in front of the cracks between the doors to stop anyone from peering in. Tim acknowledges homophobia exists at other schools, but says at Redfield, the teaching was that homosexual acts were a grave mortal sin. So it's not just, you're different from me, so I'm gonna punch you. It's, you're different from me, I'm gonna punch you, and you're gonna spend 
all of eternity in the fiery depths of hell because of something that you can't change about yourself. And for me personally, it was, I was such a strong believer and I would go to church every day and it would get to the point that as a 12, 13 year old, I would go to bed in tears most nights and I would pray with every fibre of my faith that I would wake up as a different person the next day, where perhaps I'm not going to get picked on even by the teachers. Pared says no children are victimised because of their sexual orientation. The alumni acknowledge the schools have a strong academic record and perform well in the HSC. Not all staff are teaching misinformation. But when they tried to bring their deep concerns about the schools to the attention of the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, they say they were told they had to go to the schools first. I brought to their attention the fact that that wouldn't be effective because these are the people, the school is built around these people's values and their, their families. Without an adequate complaints avenue, there's no hope of any of these issues being rectified because there's no platform for people to be able to even acknowledge wrongdoing. For such a small community, these schools have a large imprint on the political class in New South Wales, including Premier Dominic Perrottet. The Premier was school captain at Redfield and his siblings went to Redfield and Tangara. The children of his finance minister, Damien Chudhope, also attended the schools and numerous other current and former politicians and political staffers here at the New South Wales Parliament are also linked to the schools. I guess the elephant in the room, my uh, uncle Damien Tudhope, uh, he's very big in the Pared Opus Dei community there. Um, He's the finance minister in New South Wales. Finance minister of New South Wales, I believe the leader of the upper house of the New South Wales parliament. So all of my cousins, um, all of Damien's children went to Redfield and Tangara. After Damien Tudhope, New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet is the third member of this school community to hold the state seat of Epping. Premier Perrottet is one of a family of 12 children and his siblings attended Redfield and Tangara. The Perrottets are a very large family. Uh, they've been at the schools for a very long time. They are a very integral part of the, of the Pared community um, at both Tangara and Redfield. Mr Perrottet's parents are married members of Opus Dei known as supernumeraries. They appeared on a Compass program in 2000. You're called a what, a strictly a supernumerary? A supernumerary. Perhaps 80% of the people in the work are married people living in their own homes, working in their own jobs. And all they want Opus Dei is often referred to as the work. And I met my husband through, through Opus Dei and we have a wonderful family uh, because of the encouragement given. We have 12 children, I We bet. do, we do. Um, it's quite a big family. It is, and it's been absolutely wonderful. And if it wasn't for the work, I don't know where I would be today. Dominic Perrottet has visited Tangara in his official capacity as Premier and used Tangara and Redfield students in promotional material as an MP. We don't know what Dominic Perrottet knows about what's being taught at Tangara. But if he does know, what does it say? I would say, if he genuinely didn't know that that was going on, to truly listen to the people who have come forward, be careful about what role Opus Dei plays in children's education because while 
they might be learning what he thinks is a very good, strong Catholic faith. The things that can, you know, seem good can be insidious. Dominic Perrottet declined to be interviewed or to answer our questions, but he is referring the schools to the New South Wales Education Standards Authority for an investigation. This promotional video, released by Dominic Perrottet, has recently been removed from YouTube. For Alex, the insidious teachings at the school carried on when she moved into an Opus Day study centre when she was 18. It was like something from a bygone era. She says she and the other young numeries were made to rise and clean the house at 5.30am in white uniforms, a practice they made fun of. And she was so busy, she barely had time to think. It's not surprising then that every other moment that you have comes, the first thought that comes to your head is Opus Day. Did you have control of your finances? No. When we moved into a centre, we were to give our card and our bank login details to the directress of the centre, and every week we would ask for the amount of money that we needed. Alex had been introduced to Opus Dei at the age of 16 by her teacher at Tangara, Rosa de Cavallo, who was a senior staff member at the school for nine years. Like many of the mentors, Rosa de Cavallo was a numeri. She was directress of the Eromeran Study Centre, where Alex lived from the age of 18. Alex says she became depressed and anxious while living there. I was just getting worse and worse. I couldn't sleep at night and um, I felt so depressed at times that I felt suicidal. That was when Rosa de Cavallo instigated a physical relationship with Alex. At the very same time, she was teaching at Tangara that same-sex relationships were strictly forbidden. As Rosa realised I wasn't sleeping well and I was waking up in the middle of the night, she asked me if I wanted to come sleep on the floor in her room. But then over time, it was from the floor in her room to in the bed next to her. And it was like a slippery slope, like eventually, like there was just more and more sensuality and things that we did that we knew we shouldn't be doing, not as numeries at least. Rosa de Cavallo made Alex a diary that is full of declarations of love. The stars lean down to kiss you and I lie down and miss you. I never wanted anything so much than to drown in your love. And at this point you are 18, 19. Yeah. And how old was Ro Rosa? Um, I think... She was 36 or 37. And she's the person that brought you into Opus Day at the age of 16? Yes. Other people have said, no, Rosa was in a position of power. She wasn't only significantly older than you, she was your directress. She was also your teacher before that. In 2016, overcome by stress, Alex left Opus Day and came out as a lesbian. In 2019, she decided to tell her story on a podcast. The Opus Day community found out almost immediately. Rosa de Cavallo begged Alex to take it down. I think within the next couple of weeks I got a call from Pared, the organisation that runs the schools, and that he wanted me to be part of an independent investigation into Rosa. And I was just so 
traumatized by how the, the whole podcast had unfolded and how it'd been taken down so quickly that I just said, no, I don't want to be part of it. I took down the podcast and I don't want to talk about it anymore. Rosa de Cavallo resigned from her teaching position and left for Brazil. Pared and Opus Dei declined interviews. They say an external investigation found no evidence of any reportable conduct. Alex has cut all ties with Opus Dei. I think being in Opus Dei for so long, it was in a way feeling like I was living in a prison. For Alex, like all of these young people who have spoken to Four Corners, the Opus Dei schooling system and culture has left permanent scars. There is so much from Tangara and Opus Dei that have left me as someone who feels very, very small. It is hell on earth and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And so I would hope if anyone out there is, is watching and has a position of power to maybe just turn the eye onto these independent schools and just make sure that the children that are being educated there aren't actually being psychologically harmed by the education that they are receiving. That's all that I can ask for because it's 20 years later and it's still going on and it won't change from their own selves. What's the feeling in here when you think about those children? Oh, I just feel so alone for them. We didn't have people on TV talking about these things when I was at school. It's really quite confronting. It's, it's kind of a big deal to make a choice to speak like this. I'm speaking for them because they deserve it. And without something like this, there won't be a change, unfortunately.